Since you found me, I've never been on my own. When fear surrounds me, in you I find my home. You are my hope. Since the day you changed me.
Set me in place, set me in place, till it's all that I know. Set me in place, set me in place, and I'll never grow cold. Set me in place, set me in place, till it's all that I know. Set me in place, set me in place, and I'll never grow cold.
Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. 
this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it's there to guide us and to lead us and to light our path. Lord, I ask that we would allow it to do that today, that we would really focus on what you're trying to tell us, what you're trying to teach us. Lord, I thank you that you're constantly trying to help us and and speak to us, and Lord, help us to have ears to hear. Have your way in this service and in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And normally, right here after I say amen, uh, I would tell you to take out your friend to friend card. But since we haven't been together in a building for so long, um, we, most of you probably don't even have friend to friend cards. But let's always remember to pray for the people that we know that haven't yet come to know Jesus. So from now on, I'm just going to say, let's pray for our loved ones who haven't yet come to know the Lord. How about that? Is that good with you? Yeah. Okay, good. It's good with me. So welcome to Grace Online. Let's pray for our loved ones who haven't yet come to know Jesus, especially those that the Lord has strongly put on our hearts. And then let's pray for ourselves as we open up God's word this morning. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for those that you placed on our hearts to pray for. We thank you that you love them more than we do. And we ask that you do whatever it takes to bring them into your kingdom. And we thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for your word. I ask that as we open it up, that it would be a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, that you would help us walk the way you want us to walk and live the way that you want us to live. Lord, help us to hear from your Holy Spirit today and become more like you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Yep, we're in the book of Revelation. <laughs> Everybody thinks Revelation is some big spooky book. It's not really. You know what? Uh, we read it last week, but this is one of the few books that says if you read it, you get a blessing. So read the book of Revelation. We're doing that right now. Revelation 2, we're going to go... Uh, verses 1 through 7, it says, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know all the things that you do. I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, 
but are not, you have discovered they are liars. Well, tell me what you really think. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting, but I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans, just as I do. Anyone with, excuse me, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. And we'll stop there. That's, that's clear to everybody, isn't it? Well, I want to start first by saying, you know, this is a, this is a message to the church in Ephesus. Remember, he, he talked last week about uh, all these various churches. And these that he says it in the, in the order in which John would have had to walk because they didn't have cars or ride a donkey or something like that or a camel and this is the order that they would have been in so the first one is Ephesus and Ephesus is interesting to me because Ephesus um, Paul sent Timothy to be the bishop of the church of Ephesus and I don't know if this was before or after that but it's just interesting to me because this seems to be I mean, if you just look at it, and it's just you and me looking at it, this looks like a pretty good church, doesn't it? You know, they, they, they don't tolerate false doctrines. They don't tolerate evil people. They, you know, and, and this looks like a pretty good church. And, and in other translations, it says, but I have this one thing against you. How many of you would like God to only have one thing against you? Anybody? <laughs> I, I, I wish he could say that about me, but um, <coughs> Ephesus is um, considered by most historians to be the center of trade in the Roman Empire. So really, when, when Paul sent Timothy there, it, it was kind of a compliment. But, but Timothy was worried because he, was, he thought he was too young to be the bishop of a church. Bishop means, in case you didn't know, there's a lot of people that give themselves titles, okay? <laughs> you know, you, you, you see these titles, of bishop, apostle, prophet, you know, pastor, teacher, you know, on the sign out front. Um, you know, you, you, a bishop is a real thing. And, and a bishop is a guy who is in charge of several churches. Uh, he's not the pastor, but he's the pastor of the pastor. That's what a bishop is. And he helps these churches uh, with the various problems that they may have and supports them um, in, in the way that he can. So that's what a bishop is, and that's what Timothy was. But Timothy isn't in this book. So anyway, but it was, it was a very important city. Uh, it, was a, it was a metropolitan area one of the few metropolitan areas in the known world at that time. You know, they didn't have, you know, metroplexes all over the place back then. But Ephesus kind of was one of those. Um, most of the people that visited Asia in Roman times would most probably land first in Ephesus because it was that important of a city. It was set high on several hills and rested at the junction of three large rivers. The church there was established by Paul, and Timothy, like I said, later came back to correct some controversies and false teachings that had been going on in that church. But Ephesus was known for its worship of a false goddess named Artemis, who was a Greek goddess, and her temple was there. And the people who worshipped her got really, 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 really ticked off when Paul started preaching the gospel. You remember that? Caused a riot. 
Man, that Paul was just a riot, man. <laughs> Not that kind of a riot. It caused a real riot. And, the, you know, the, 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 the officials had to come in and break it up. And they kind, of, they kind of tried to bring it to the judge in the area. And he says, this is, this is, this is your law, you know, bring that to somebody else. I'm not going to deal with it. So Paul got away from the beating that they wanted to give him. But it said that Timothy was martyred there in the temple of Artemis. Now that is something that is said throughout, you know, people that know church history. We're not positive that it can be verified, but uh, just like we all talk about Peter being crucified upside down, that is a that is a tradition that has been passed on from you know centuries up to century to century to century through the church. We believe it's true, but uh, it it may not be. It's, it's really not that important. So if it's not that important, why are you telling us, Don? Because I think it's nice to know a little bit of the history of these places. Um, you probably hate history. I, I love history. I hated it when I was in school, but I love it now. Uh, the Nicolaitans that are mentioned here in this text are people who believe that freedom in Christ basically means that the moral laws of Scripture are no longer valid and that Christ did not come to change a person's behavior, but just forgave our sins. Here Jesus makes it clear that he hates this teaching. You know, that it's still going around right now. And it goes around, you know, well, we're under grace and not the law, so we can do whatever we want to. That is the teaching that it says right here that Jesus hates. You know, it doesn't say a whole lot of things in the Bible that Jesus hates. But he hates that teaching. You know why? Because people, people run around thinking that they're, that they're okay. And they're destined for hell. And God doesn't want any of us to go to hell. You know, I know there are people out there that think God wants all of us to go to hell. That's not the truth. God has loved you since he thought of you. Since he thought of you being on this planet, God has loved you and he still does. He doesn't want bad things to happen to you or to me. So the Ephesian church here is commended for a lot of things. They work hard. They persevere. They don't tolerate wickedness. They only put up with sound doctrine. And they have endured hardship with a good attitude. How many of you have endured hardship? I have. Did you do it with a good attitude? I hope so. Sometimes I did. And, and sometimes I, I messed up and gotten ticked off. Have you, have you done that? Well, these guys, they did it with a good attitude. So this sounds like a good church. And any of us that were looking at this church from the outside, we would be thinking, hey, that church in Ephesus is a good church. We need to go there. Um, Jesus had a problem with them, though, because they have lost the main thing. They've lost the main thing. Have you lost the main thing? See, some people think that they're walking with Jesus simply because they show up to church. Well, that, that doesn't make you a Christian. And they listen to the word being taught. They may even listen to the word being taught on the radio. They may have even given their thousand dollar vow. Doesn't make you a Christian. Because these guys did all the right things. But they forgot the main thing. Do you know what the main thing is? We're going to talk about it. Luke 13, verses 25 through 27, says, When the master of the house has locked the door, it will be too late. You will stand outside knocking and pleading, Lord, open the door for us. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, but we ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. And he will reply, I tell you, I don't know you or where you come from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. I don't want God to say that to me, do you? 
See, the, the, real, the real thing that is the main thing is for us to love God and love his people and for him to love us back because we get to know him. See, he, it's a relationship with the guy who created everything. Am I making sense? It, it, it's not doing all the works. Because if it was doing all the works, these guys in Ephesus had done all the works. They did all the stuff you're supposed to do. But they started taking Jesus for granted. Have you done that? I know a lot of Christians who've done that. But it's a bleak picture, isn't it? People who believe that they're serving God all of their lives and yet hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. Well, it's nice that you did all those, uh, all those works. Well, it was really good that you did all that stuff. But I don't know you. I don't want him to say that to me. I never knew you. It's all about relationship. That's the difference between New Testament Christianity, which is grace, and the Old Testament law. Old Testament law, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do that thing. You better not do this. You know, that's, that's the Old Testament law. Now, God's standard of righteousness hasn't changed. But the way we get there has changed. Do you know the way we get there? Do you know the way that we get to God's standard of righteousness? Is to know Jesus. To get to know Jesus. And let him control your life. Look at Matthew chapter 7, 21. It's, it's, it's a similar chapter, or it's a similar passage. It says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On Judgment Day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast, demons, cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. You know, those things that they said that they're, they're doing, those, are, those are, are things that Christians do, right? But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. I never knew you. I want you to understand here, though, this is not a teaching on works. Works will not save you. The church in Ephesus did all the right works, and yet Jesus was saying, you lack one thing. You lack the main thing. Jeremiah 9. Verse 23 and 24. This is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom. Do you know people that do that? I'm smarter than the average bear. <laughs> you know people like that? Yeah. Um, or the powerful boast in their power. Or the rich boast in their riches. We all know people like that. I hope you're not a person like that. Don't be a person like that. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth and that I delight in these things I the Lord have spoken see that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord that's what gets you to that place where you're standing before God. And he says, yeah, heck yeah, come on in. Well done, good and faithful servant. It's getting to know him. It's getting to love him. Because if you know him, if you really know him, you love him. And you know what? If you love him, you know what you're going to do? 
you're going to love people. You can't be any other way and know Jesus. Anybody agree with me? Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> John 10, verses 14 and 15 says, Jesus is speaking here. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Just as my father knows me and I know the father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. See, we're, we're his sheep. <laughs> and we know him. See, sheep are interesting. And sheep is a pretty, pretty much a perfect example of what we should be as believers in Jesus Christ. Because sheep don't see very well. And so they have to go by what they hear. And they recognize their master's voice. And we as believers in Jesus Christ, we should be able to recognize our master's voice too. Because Jesus is our master. He's the one that's in control of our lives. I mean, isn't it cool? We got the guy who created everything who's in control of our lives. That's Jesus. It says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And later on it said, and the Word became flesh. That's Jesus. That Word that God spoke, let there be, you fill in the blank. That was Jesus. That Word was Jesus word so let's move down same chapter John 10 to John 27 and 28 John 10 verses 27 and 28 says my sheep listen to my voice I know them and they follow me I give them eternal life and they will never perish no one can snatch them away from me isn't that a great couple of verses you know my sheep listen to my voice are you listening to his voice right now or are you or are you listening to the wrong voice I, I see a lot of Christians listening to the wrong voice they just follow along the ways of this world and think because you know they they go to church every now and then that they've punched their church time clock and you know, God's got to God's got to accept them. What? <laughs> right? It's not the way it is. We need to listen to His voice. And 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 inherently in the word "listen" is if we listen, then we do what He says. See, a sheep listens. Why do you think a sheep listens? Well, he listens. To know where he's going. And so he, if he's listening to his shepherd, if we're listening to our shepherd, we're going to go where our shepherd's going. Am I making any sense to anybody? Because I'm talking to you right now about the most important thing. You know, don't, don't get caught up in signs and wonders. Because those people in, in Matthew, they did all kinds of signs and wonders. But Jesus looked at them and said, I never knew you. I want him to look at me and say, oh, I've been waiting for you to get here. we got a couple of things we need to talk about. You made it, but we need to talk about a few things. <laughs> well, in, the, in our text, in Revelation chapter 2, look over there with me again. Jesus is speaking to the church in Ephesus. He says, I know the things that you do. I've seen your hard work. That's good. And your patient endurance. That's good. I know you don't tolerate evil people. That's good. I know churches that tolerate all kinds of evil people. You know, let, let's not do that. Oh, but we might hurt their feelings. 
you're really going to hurt their feelings if they end up in the line that's going to hell and they see you're in the line that goes to heaven and you never said anything. It goes on to say you have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. See, the, the Holy Spirit will give us the ability to, um, it's called discernment, discernment of spirit. So have, you ever, have you ever heard somebody talking and, and preaching something or other, but just inside there was something going off in your heart that was saying, this is false. Have you ever had that happen? I have. That's the Holy Spirit warning you, hey, this, this dude or this gal is somebody you need to stay away from and don't do what they're teaching you to do. That's what the Ephesians did. Again, a really good thing. It says, you have patiently suffered for me without quitting. Remember, remember the passage of Scripture says, that, that says, um, do not become weary in doing what is good, for at the proper time you'll reap a harvest if you don't give up. They were doing that. Good thing, right? Not a good thing. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Notice he says you don't love me or each other because God wants us to love each other. He says that people will know that we're his disciples because we love one another. And this translation, I think, translates it the best. You see, we've lost, we've, we've, we've lost the main thing. What's the main thing? Loving God and loving people. That's the main thing. Not being a phony and pretending like you love everybody but you really don't. See, Jesus can see that if you're being a phony. God hasn't called any of us to be a phony. He's called us to genuinely love him and love people. And that, my friend, is the main thing. That's the main thing. I don't care how well you preach. I don't care how well you pray. I don't care... You know, how much you give to the poor. I don't care if you go out every time they go out to feed the homeless. I don't care any of that stuff. There's the other stuff I could mention. I, I don't care. I care how much you love Jesus. And how much do you love people. Because that, and only that, is the mark of a Christian. That's the main thing. We need to beware that we don't forget. We don't lose the main thing. Am I making sense to anybody? Mm -hmm. A theme throughout the Bible is actually putting action to our faith. And that's what I'm talking about this morning. If you love Jesus, if I love Jesus, I will do what he says. Right? I'll be like a sheep. I'll hear his voice and I'll just go back and wander right after him. Because that's my shepherd. And I'm going to follow him to that green pasture and that still water that he leads me to. You read Psalm 23? If you haven't, Read, read the 23rd Psalms, really really short, six verses. Read the 23rd Psalm. That's, our, that's what our shepherd's doing for us. If I love Jesus, I will do what he says. I won't simply hear what he says. Well, that was good. That was good, what he said about sin. That was really good. You know, God really doesn't care if you think what I'm preaching is. Or teaching is good. He really doesn't care. What he cares about is the Holy Spirit's talking to you right now. I'm not the only one talking to you. 
The Holy Spirit's talking to you right now. Are you listening? And will you do something with it? I won't simply hear what he says. If I'm a good sheep, I'll do it. If I know him and I trust him, it's going to reflect in what I do. If you know him and you trust him, it's going to reflect in what you do. That verse that I keep quoting, you wonder where it is? John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. If you love me, and, and, and that's simply, he's not talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about what we were talking about with the sheep. If you love me, you'll do what I tell you to do. And it'll end up being, you, you'll act like a righteous person. Not following the law, but following Jesus. See, relationship in Christianity means doing what Jesus tells us to do. And what he's told us to do, he said to the people when he was walking this planet that the most important commandment in the Bible is to love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And he said the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Hi, neighbor. Am I a follower of Christ, Jesus, or merely a listener? Are, are you a follower of Jesus or merely a listener? You know, that's okay. You might be a Jesus fan. I'm a Jesus fan. I even listen to Jesus on the radio. I listen to Jesus music. I have Jesus t-shirts. I have little Jesus statues all over the house. I just have Jesus, 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 Jesus everywhere. I'm a Jesus fan. That doesn't get you anywhere. It really doesn't. That doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't get me anywhere. I mean, it, you know, it's nice that you listen to Christian music. It's nice that you listen to people preaching and teaching. It just doesn't get you anywhere. Do you love him? And do you love his people? Do you do what he says? Because you love him. Because if you love him, you will trust him. And when he tells you to do something, you'll do it. James 1, verses 22 through 24, James says, But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise... You're only fooling yourselves. See, if, if you're just a Jesus fan, you're, you're fooling yourself. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. <laughs> that, that's... That... that you know, piece of scripture there. As well, to me, I think visually. Do you? And I'm looking. I'm thinking of this guy who's looking at his face in the mirror, primping in the morning. You know, getting his beard just right. You know, brushing his teeth, fixing his hair, and then he walks off and he forgets what he looks like. Gets pulled over by the police. Policeman says, "Can I have your ID and your registration?" And he and he gives his driver's license and his registration. And he says, is this you? And he looks at it and goes, I've never seen that person in my life. No, I'm sorry, that's a dumb guy. I don't want to be a dumb guy with Jesus. See, because the Bible is a mirror. It really is. It's a mirror. And when we open it up, it shouldn't just be words. When we open it up, we should see ourselves. And a lot of times we see ourselves in not such a flattering position. Have you ever done that? You open the Bible, you start reading, and it's like, ooh, I've been doing that. You mean I shouldn't do that? Oh, ow, that hurts. Anybody ever had that? See, that's that mirror reflecting back at you. 
And, and what you do with that mirror makes all the difference. Because God's showing us something. And it's showing us what we look like spiritually. Not so that we can walk away from the mirror and just feel bad. That's not God's purpose. God's purpose is maybe we, yeah, maybe you feel bad a little bit. But the only reason you feel bad is that God wants you to turn away from whatever that is and he will help you. So you're not doing it on your own. If you're following your shepherd, your shepherd pretty much helps you do everything that you do. And that's our shepherd, Jesus. See, he's showing us what we're building our lives on when we look in his book. It says in Matthew 7, verses 26 and 27, But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. So that's what happens. You really don't see what a person is building their life on during the good times. You see what a person is building their life on when things aren't so rosy. Because it's easy to be happy. It's easy to be positive. It's easy to, to be all that stuff when everything's going right. Not so easy when everything's going wrong. And that's what Jesus is saying. If you don't listen, if you listen to his word, but you don't do anything with it, you're going to be like a person who builds his house on the sand. Now, I want you to, to, to realize the rain and the storm, it's going to come. The winds are going to blow in your life. But that guy's house falls down with a great crash. In another translation, it says it was completely destroyed. We don't want that to happen to our lives. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3 says, When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. See, so... Paul's even telling us there, you know what, there's going to be real difficult times coming. And the question is, are you ready? Am I ready? Have we remembered the main thing? Or are we trying to build our life on something false? I want to remember the main thing. Do you? I want to remember the main, what, what, what did I say the main thing was? To love God and to love our neighbor, to love people. That's the mark of a Christian, to love God and to love people. Jeremiah was a bullfrog, um, 8, 11. They offer superficial treatments for my people's mortal wound. They give assurances of peace when there is no peace. God's talking about the priests there, and he says they, they offer superficial treatments. In other words, they, th these people have this mortal wound, and they're just giving them a Band-Aid to put on it. So that's what the people in the world are doing when we go to the world to get advice for the way we live. You may have a mortal wound in your life. And you know what? If you have a mortal wound in your spiritual life, the only one who can heal that mortal wound, his name is Jesus. And he loves you. And he's always loved you. And he wants to touch you. And he wants to heal you. And he wants to get to know you. And for you to get to know him. That's the most important thing to him. See, the, the, the main thing for us is to love him, and he'll teach us to love people. But you know what? The main thing to Jesus is to love us. 
and to love the people that we love. See, it's not really that different, is it? That's the main thing for Jesus. And that's what he does in your life and mine. We don't need a band-aid for our problems in this life. We need to be healed. The doer in the book of James, verse 25, verse 125, sorry, says, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. In another translation, it says, you'll be blessed in all that you do. That word blessed means, oh, how happy. You will be, oh, how happy in all that you do. Wouldn't you want to be, oh, how happy? Mm -hmm. I like it when I'm, oh, how happy. How about you? Yes. You don't say it that way because people would think you're strange. You don't walk up to somebody and go, hey, Evelyn, I'm, oh, how happy. <laughs> you, she walk up, but it's wrong with Don. But, you know, you know what it means. You'll be happy in everything that you're doing because God's blessing you. I want that. See, the doer is blessed in all that he does. And when we love God and do what God tells us to do, God pours out his blessings on us. How many of you want to be blessed by God? I do. There's an easy way to do that. You listen for him to tell you what to do, and then you do it. I know, I know so many people who've come up to me and, and, and said, You know, Don, God told me to do this. And whenever anybody says that, I'm the kind of person that I keep track. I mean, no, I'm not like following them around or anything, but I just kind of wait to see, are they going to do what they said God told them to do? You know, you know what? Most of the time they don't. And that's sad because if you do what God tells you to do, He's going to bless you in everything that you do. And I want God's blessing. So how do I get it? I do what he tells me to do. Matthew 7 is going to talk about that guy who's building a house. It says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. See, the other guy was foolish. Why? Because he listened to his teaching but he didn't follow it. He just walked away going, that was good. Don't be that guy. That guy's a dumb guy. Don't be that guy. And it says he's wise like a person who builds his house on, excuse me, on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock where Fred and Barney live. <laughs> hey, Fred. Hey, Barney. Um, that was a terrible impression, by the way. Anyway, but listening to his word and following it, we're like that guy who builds his house on bedrock. And the winds come, the winds blow. The waters rise. And you know what? The house stays intact. You know, we've all seen the video of the latest hurricane that went through Louisiana and up through, you know, the south and into the northeast. And see all the water damage that's happened up there. And all the flooding and all that. See, storms are going to come in our lives. That's what Jesus is saying. Notice both of these guys, both of these guys listened to his teaching. Both of these guys had terrible storms in their lives. But one guy's house fell down. And the other guy's house was fine. Why? I mean, watching the news, I've seen that exact same thing happen. Have you? There'll be one guy in the neighborhood, his whole house is like blown away. 
And another guy, same neighborhood, his house is fine. Why? I don't know in that particular instance, but I know in our lives, it, it, it is that way because we listen to Jesus and we do what he says. And we, get, we, we make the main thing the main thing. We're always to love God. And we're always to love our neighbor. Psalms 1, 1 through 3. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. Most of the people on TV or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, the people that make fun of the truth. You know, there are people out there that do that. Have you had people that, that make fun of the truth to you? I have. You start talking about Jesus Especially talking about how Jesus is coming back soon. You'll get a lot of people mocking you. But none of us like to be mocked, do we? But don't stand around with those people. Don't, don't make those people your circle of friends. And this psalmist did not. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. So they, they think about God's word. You know, in, in, in your quiet time, people say, well, how much did you read? I read until I find something that I can meditate on all day. It could be the first verse that I read. I might have to read two or three chapters. But I want something to meditate on. I want something... To think about all day long. Because you know what? When you, you're going to do what you think about. Is that true or not? Mm -hmm. You're going to do what you're thinking about. And this guy, I think it was David, who wrote this psalm, he's thinking about the law of the Lord day and night. And it says, They are like trees planted along river, the riverbanks, bearing fruit. Each season, their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. That word prosper does not mean get rich, but it means that they are successful in everything that they put their hand to. You want to be successful in everything that you do? How many of you want to be successful in the success in life? Mm -hmm. Give that thousand dollar vow. No. Shut up, Don. <laughs> but... I want to be successful in everything I do. And the only way to do that is to do the main thing. Love God and love people. And if we love God, we're not going to be making fun of the Bible. We're not going to be making fun of the truth of the Bible. We're going to be following the Bible. We're going to be telling people about the things that we've learned in the Bible, aren't we? Because I want to be like those trees planted along the river banks that bears its fruit each season. I like to say this. We, we used to go tubing down the Suwannee River when we went to youth camp in, in Florida. And um, there were these big, huge trees that people would build tree houses in them. A lot of them would have these ropes where people would, would uh, have a, an inner tube tied on it and they would swing out into the into the river off of it, build, build high platforms to, to dive off of, all these things you see, you know, that, that people were doing with these trees. Why? Because they were huge trees. Why were they huge trees? I'm glad you asked. Because they were planted by a river that wasn't like a lot of the rivers around here, but this is the such and such river. And you look and it's just dirt. <laughs> Not right now. Right now we got a lot of rain happening. But have you seen those? You know, you're driving over a little bridge, you know, a little freeway bridge or, or a little road bridge and, and it says, this is the such and such river and it's just dirt. Well, that's not the kind of river you want to plant your tree by. <laughs> you want to plant your tree by a, tr by a river like the Swanee River. 
It's deep. It's got clean, fresh water. So that your roots will go deep into the soil and be nourished. That's what God wants for you. So, today, let's decide to walk with Jesus in a relationship, not religion. You might say, well, you say not religion. What are you talking about? Isn't Jesus, you know, the head of a religion? No. See, that's the thing that, that we have to understand. Being a true believer in Jesus Christ, that's about relationship. That's why Jesus didn't say to those people that were at the door, he, you, did you notice? He didn't say, you didn't attend church enough. I've got your attendance right here, and you didn't attend church enough. He didn't say that. He didn't say, you didn't witness enough. He didn't say that. What did he say? I never knew you. I never knew you. What we call Christianity is a relationship. See, religion is man building a system trying to get to God. You can't, you can't ever do that. Christianity, or being a believer in Jesus Christ, is God reaching down to man and building a relationship with him that lasts forever. So let's walk with Jesus in a relationship. Let's not listen to the word or just listen to the word and deceive ourselves. Let's be doers of God's word. Let's do it. And let's remember to keep the main thing the main thing. In a minute we're going to do something that it's just a, a demonstration of what Jesus has done in our lives. We're going we're gonna to do something, and you know, anybody, any of you that are watching that uh, are, are unfamiliar with what believers in Jesus Christ do, this, it, we call it communion. But what it really is, it's the Lord's Supper. And we do just a little part of it. And um, we're going to do that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a demonstration with crackers and grape juice of what Jesus did for us on the cross to take our sin, to take your sin, and prepare a place for us in heaven to be with him for all of eternity. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you that when we listen to your word, when we listen to you and follow you, we fall in love with you because we really get to know you. And you have loved us so deeply that we can't even put words to it sometimes. So Lord, help us to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And Lord, help us to love our neighbor. Help us not to forget what the main thing is. Help us to not make church just some club that we belong to. Help us to make our walk with you exactly that. A relationship with you. And with everybody's heads bowed and their eyes closed. How many this morning would say, you know, I, I really don't know Jesus the way that you're talk, talking about. And I really would like my sins forgiven. I really would like when I walk up to the door of heaven for Jesus to say, well done, come on in. But I don't think he'll say that right now if I were to walk to the door of heaven today. 
If that's you, I'd love to pray with you. Because Jesus took your sin on the cross. He died for you. And he died for me. So that when we walk up to the door of heaven, he can say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. And if you'd like that today, if you'd like to be forgiven of all of your sin, if you'd like to surrender the, the driver's seat, as it were, of your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to do something. You might think it's silly. I want everybody's heads bowed, everybody's eyes closed. But if that's you, would you lift up your hand right now? Because I'd like to pray with you so that you won't ever have to fear again what Jesus is going to say when you walk up to the door of heaven. If that's you, raise your hand. I know I can't see you, but God can. Anybody else before we pray? All right, I want you to pray this prayer out loud. They aren't magic words, but it's just a prayer of repentance, and it's a prayer asking Jesus to come into your life and be the Lord of your life. If you'd like to pray that, then pray this prayer after me out loud. I want everybody, even if you've prayed this 15 million times, I want everybody to pray this out loud so that those people uh, who are doing this for the first time or maybe redoing it again um, won't feel self-conscious. Okay, let's, let's pray right now. Dear Lord Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I ask that you'd forgive me of my sin. Because of what you did for me on the cross. Because of what you did for me on the cross. I ask that you would come into my life. I ask that you come into my life. And be the Lord of my life. And be the Lord of my life. And I will follow you for the rest of my life. And I will follow you the rest of my life. And baptize me in your Holy Spirit. Baptize me in your Holy Spirit. It's in your name that I pray. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, welcome to the family. And let's not forget the main thing, love God and love people. And we're going to do communion this morning. Uh, we, we do it on the first Sunday of the month every month, and we'd like to do that today. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, eat it in remembrance of me. And on, and on the same night, he took the cup. It's called the cup of redemption. And he lifted it up and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. And Paul tells us that we shouldn't take communion in an unworthy manner. And what he means by that is that we should do what Jesus said. We should remember what Jesus did. That we should remember that he, he broke his body for us. And he shed his blood for us. And if you ask me in one of the most horrific ways to die, and so this morning, we're thanking him for what he did. We're remembering what he did for us on the cross. So let's pray, and then what I want you to do, Ed's going to be playing some worship music on the guitar. And what I want you to do is just take these elements in your hand and think about what they represent, his broken body, his shed blood for you. And let's remember the main thing. Not a club called church, but a relationship with the one who laid his life down for us. Let's pray. 
Lord, I thank you that you came and you died for us. That perfect lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And we thank you for that. And I ask that as we hold these elements in our hands, that we would remember what you've done for us. You've forgiven us of all of our sin. And you've prepared a place for us in heaven. And more than that, you walk with us every day. And you lead us and you guide us like a good shepherd. Lord, help us to be good sheep. Help us to follow you and to love you with all of our hearts. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you as, as you share communion with us separately.
Thank you.